This is Athens Speak Out, uh, number 420, and we are going to be discussing the presidential polling of Arthur Schlesinger Jr. as our topic. Great. Okay. So, okay, you have a question, you have, who is Arthur Schlesinger Jr.? Let me ask you that Well, question. he's a famous historian, and he initially became famous because of his book called The Age of Jackson. And That's then, right. Then he became a specialist on Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. That's did, right. Did a bunch of New Deal right. books. Right. Uh, three parts. I've read the first two volumes. I have not read that. But I think I skipped volume three. Good. I'm more you interested. You read more of Schlesinger than I have. Well, I'm more interested in the early part of the uh, <clears throat> uh, Roosevelt administration because right. you can read a lot of other books on World War II. Right. So I think that volume three is the foreign okay. policy. But the <clears throat> volume one and two are basically about the domestic issues, about the New Deal, and some of the political machinations involving the Democratic Party and what was going on in the United States of America in the 1930s. Of course, there were called two New Deals. Another great scholar to uh, uh, look up is William Luchtenberg. Uh, he, he wrote a number of very good books about the New Deal and the domestic issues. So we have the first New Deal, which is the 100 Days, and then the second New Deal happens in 1935. Uh, before Roosevelt runs for re-election. I don't understand that. Well, I'll tell it to you okay. real briefly. I've never heard of that. The first New Deal was basically, it's called the first 100 days. Oh, okay, that's the first 100 days, yes. That's when they create all the, the uh, bureaucracy and the agencies. Roosevelt took the whole thing over, yeah. Took it over, he went on TV, he, uh, radio, I should right. say. He started giving fireside chats. Right. And one of the reasons that Roosevelt was so successful as president was that he used the fireside chat to communicate directly with the American people. Over the heads of the newspapers, Over, which were all Republicans. You've got that right. Now, the, reason, uh, the other reason was that the radio was a kind of a novel invention. It had only been around for about 20 years. I think it was 1924. Calvin Coolidge was the president. Well, yeah. Hadn't been around very long, right. but uh, Roosevelt was the first effective communicator oh, yeah, sure. using Absolutely. radio. And people, elderly people uh, <clears throat> today, s some of whom are still alive, remember the fireside chats. They I have heard fireside chats, yeah. and I've heard Roosevelt give his last speech. And sometimes two-thirds of the, the, the public would be tuned in, and right. I heard one... <clears throat> I think representative comment about the effectiveness of the fireside chat where um, the man said, Roosevelt came into our living room. He seemed like he was part of our family. He explained what he was doing. That's a little bit propaganda. But yeah. It's, it's a, it, that's Roosevelt propaganda. <laughs> that's Roosevelt propaganda, but that's why it was effective. Okay. And this uh, man that was interviewed uh, remembered his whole family sitting around the radio listening to the fireside chat. So obviously he talked about different topics. The first one was about banking. In fact, he's got a famous line, Tonight I want to talk to you about banking. <laughs> I know it's a boring subject. And he goes on and on and explains why, how he's going to reorganize the banks. Because right. the banks Banks were closed. Seventy percent of them went under, and people lost their life savings. Right. And, part and my of, father remembered that very well. Yeah, and that's what the FDI insurance became. And then they well, that came out a little later. That they, was the solution. Yeah, they created. And they had to pass legislation for that. They had to pass legislation, and in the first 100 days, the reason they call it that is. That's when the AAA, the Agricultural Administration, right. was created. The NRA. The NRA, the National Recovery Act. Yeah, uh, yeah. C the alphabetical agencies. CCC, et cetera, et cetera. Right, go ahead. Uh, relief agencies. Right. And, and that sort of thing. And then the second New Deal uh, was in 1935 in the summer. In the, the, big, the big accomplishment was the Wagner Act. And that created, that was on behalf of organized labor. All right. Parts of the New Deal had been were were being 
um, uh, shall we say, challenged in court about the legality of it. And Roosevelt had not won those cases yet. But anyway, in 1935, there was another f flurry of legislation that was passed, I believe it was August of 35. It was the recess, the summer recess, before the, the, they go out on the break. And uh, that's called the Second New Deal. In your opinion? Well, that's the, w the way the historians break some it down. Some do and some don't. Luchtenberg. I've never heard of that. Well, Luchtenberg is uh, a big theorist. If, on if that's what Luchtenberg says, I think it's plausible, but not the final word. Well, William Luchten. I would like to tell you my final word. I wear a little button. History is everything. Well, yeah. And I didn't have that button for a long time because I had a long, long process of thinking before I became a history major and a history PhD. Right. And that was a long search. Long search. And then the other alternative, which the philosophers don't like, is philosophers say that philosophy is the queen of sciences. Okay. So they are the only group who are qualified to repudiate this artic article, History is Everything. Yeah. Okay, good. And one interesting quote that I'll just paraphrase here. Go ahead. Is that there's a famous uh, British historian uh, called A.J.P. Taylor. Oh, he was my mentor. Okay. I went to... You know him. What's that? You know him. I know him. I heard his lectures. I read his book. And I was a radical in the fence in in the fact that I thought that A. J. P. Taylor was the best uh, historian I have ever known. Ox and Oxford Don, as they say. He was a Don. Yeah. Well, anyway, he wrote a a book well worth reading. I think it's uh, on the list of the some of the 100 best books of the 20th century, called The Origins of the Second World War. Well, that's a very controversial book. Yeah. But anyway, in the preface, in the introduction, whatever you want to call it, um, <clears throat> he goes into uh, what hi the job of history is. He says that the historian is there to analyze, not That's to right. justify. It's, it, the historian is there to explain, right. not to make excuses, right. or try and embellish but all the historians picture. have their biases. Well, they sure do, and of course, everybody's biased. <laughs> okay. And what one can certainly apply that uh, accusation to some extent about Arthur Schlesinger. Now, he made his academic uh, reputation on the book *The Age of Jackson*, uh, which is probably worth reading at the moment because uh, Donald Trump's so-called uh, hero from the presidents was Andrew Jackson. And Jack's, Andrew Jackson, of course. I don't think Donald Trump ever said that. Well, he did, but I don't want to debate that. <laughs> just he said everything. <laughs> well, he said everything, but I'm trying he, to he explain. Has, he, he repudiates it the next day. <laughs> yeah, well, he goes back and forth on he's a, a lot disaster. of He's a disaster. He's a disaster, but we don't want to talk about him. Okay, then don't quote. <laughs> but That's I'm, not true, true history. That's propaganda, the worst kind. Well, I'm trying to explain why okay, the uh, age of Jackson may be worth uh, uh, I don't, reading. I agree the age of Jackson is worth reading. Okay. Um, then, uh, as I said, he started to do the uh, Franklin Roosevelt books, and then he later in the 1960s, uh, was sort of a lionizer of the Kennedy brothers. That's right. John F. Kennedy. That's right. And Robert F. Kennedy. That's true. And, of course, this is the uh, upcoming 50th anniversary of the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, which right. had a major, major impact on the 1968 presidential election. That's true. That's every, every, every election is, is unique, but unique. some are transformative. Some are transformative. Okay, go ahead. And Nixon was uh, his own disaster. Yes, right. In, in, in his own uh, bad ways. Good. But to Nixon's credit, and I'll give him a, a, a brownie point here, on one subject, Nixon did read a lot, and he read a lot of history and biography. Uh, he was a big believer in the great man of history theory. So Nixon was not 
uh, intellectually, he was far superior to a lot of presidents. Uh, well, that's a lot of presidents. There's a lot of ground. Well, I'm talking here about understanding the policies, understanding what, what the Nixon, issues. What Nixon discovered was his advisor, Henry Kissinger. Yeah. And Henry Kissinger said, I can get you elected president, but you are going to have to withdraw from Vietnam and recognize the People's Republic of China. And you got to go to Beijing and change the United Nations. And well, that's what he did. That was the big accomplishment. Yes. That and detente. But well, detente is a very flexible word. Yeah. It's yeah. a French word. There's entente, which means an understanding, drawing together, an informal pact, and detente means relaxation. Right. Let's have peace. With the Soviet Union. With anybody. In other words, the... It depends on the great powers. It wasn't called glasnost uh, under Nixon, but well, the... Well, that was a town in New Jersey. Opening to China. Glasnost is a... Is a uh, Gorbachev. All right, fine. Gorbachev. Anyway, uh, You're we've, going way off the subject we've as diverted. Far as I'm concerned. Okay, we're, but we're talking about presidents here. Go ahead. I thought we were talking about Schlesinger. Well, we're going to get back to him. Okay, go ahead. We're just explaining why Schlesinger okay. is is uh, perhaps okay. worth reading. I think he's worth reading. Um, so anyway, another famous book that he wrote was called The Imperial Presidency. Uh, right. That was about. How, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, starting with Franklin Roosevelt, presidents assumed more power uh, than they had previously. Uh, before uh, Franklin Roosevelt was elected, Congress uh, was the more dominant branch of government. When? Before Franklin Roosevelt. That's true. And Franklin Roosevelt put more power into the executive branch of government. Uh, than it had had before that. Now, of course, there were strong presidents, presidents with big visions like uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, James Polk was always regarded as a... James Polk was an imperialist. He was an imperialist, but Who he was... Conquered Texas. He was regarded by presidential historians... As a decisive president. As yeah. a strong president. Yes, he was a strong president. With, Dis with no, I would say, well, I would call him a decisive, transformative president. But what was interesting about him was he agreed to only serve one term. Yes, and he knew that. And that might have explained some of his effectiveness. That's right. In other words, he, uh, he was decisive. But we don't want to debate the Mexican-American War. Uh, okay, go ahead. Because different presidents have had their own uh, imprint on the, yes. the position. Right. Um, and they fall into the category of strong, moderate, and weak. Many of the weak presidents were the Whigs uh, before the Civil War. Very weak party. And some of the Republicans after uh, That's the right. end of Reconstruction. The Whigs committed suicide. The Federalist Party committed suicide. Yeah. But well, it was replaced by the Republican Party. The Whigs merged with the uh, uh, Know Nothings and the one of the some of the populist parties and some of the uh, they committed suicide yeah but they just changed their name they were basically well they took the name from England yeah the, Whig, the Liberal Party in England was known as Whigs and that's only a slang word right the the British Party had conservatives and liberals okay so the Whigs were a liberal party and the conservatives were the Tory party Tories yep yes. Wigs and Tories. And the slang word is that those were gangsters. <laughs> the Tory was an Irish gangster, and the Whig was a Scotch gangster. <laughs> right. Well, that explains a lot. <laughs> about and the, the British had, a, had a, 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 a... The Church of England, it was a church religion. Yeah. Okay. And they became Episcopalians in the United States. Right. And Abraham Lincoln was a Whig. He, he served one term in Congress. Well, not exactly. During the, the, the Mexican-American no. well, yes, War he, as a Whig. 
Yes, he was elected in Congress as a Whig. Yes. That's true. Because the Republican Party didn't exist yet. But he didn't really believe in the Whigs. John Fremont was the first uh, character that ran as a, quote, Republican. Yes. I thought it was Kit Carson. No. John, John Fremont. Well, we'll have to look that up. But he's similar. He's, uh, he was an explorer. Pony Express driver. Explorer. T took the mail to the West on horseback. Right. A, a kind of a pioneer type. Right. A legend. Well, we'll look that one up. If we had Judy Days, oh, she would tell us in a second. Well, that's uh, okay, go ahead. fine. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so we can look that one up. Uh, but getting back to Schlesinger, yes, what, now ahead. what is it you want to know more about? What do I want to know? Yeah. I had a modified view of Arthur Schlesinger. I said that I was going to write my memoirs, okay. which began with from my, over my lifetime. Right. Franklin Roosevelt to Donald Trump, and they're still alive, okay? So I rated Roosevelt, Truman, and right on down, and the United States is getting more conservative and drifting to the right because of the dominance of the Republican Party, which came out after the Goldwater election. The Republicans said, you will not criticize any Republican. Uh -huh. And as a result, in reaction to Goldwater, they took over all of the state legislatures and all of the House and Supreme Court, as many offices as they could get. Well, it took them a long time. I mean, yeah, the, Dem the Democrats ran uh, the Senate and the House for quite a number of years. Yeah, when Nixon was president. When Nixon was when president. When Nixon was president, there was a large Democratic minority who but could object. The Democrats were on the wane, not so much because of uh, any magic thing that happened, other than the fact that the Southern Democrats bolted from uh, the party. And George. Now, what Wa year are we talking about? Well, we're talking 68 here. George Wallace ran as an independent in 1968. Good. And he won either five or six uh, Southern states right. on a racist segregationist platform. Segregation now and forever was his slogan. Right. And he was a Democrat. He, he, he had, elected. He belonged to the Democratic Party. But as an, then they from Alabama. the Dixocratic Party. Well, the Dixocrats came in 48, but 48, so. Strom yeah. Thurmond was the Dixocrat. That, right. And, and then he decided to become a Republican. So over time, <laughs> 1948 onward, right. uh, the Democrats started to slowly Disintegrate. Well, no, dis disintegrate. Well, not disintegrate. Change. They, no, debate amongst themselves. They had three factions. Yes, okay. And America often talks about a two-party system, but I think it's fair to say that the Republicans have always had two factions, and the Democrats used to have three. I think But now they have two. No, there are actually four factions. There are conservative Democrats and liberal Democrats. Right. And in the primary, that's determined. And then there are actually conservative Republicans and liberal Republicans. Well, liberal Republicans are... are disappeared. They yeah. have disappeared. And conservative Democrats are hard to find anymore either. In other words, the Southern Ernest Hollings type or uh, Howell Heflin uh, are, don't exist uh, anymore. The, the segregationists... Uh, are gone from the Democratic Party. Um, so that's something that has happened during our lifetime. Well, you're really talking about the problem of racism, and that's a different problem altogether. Well, it's a different problem altogether, but it uh, explains why the Democrats have been on the wane. The Democrats um, have a We're not justifying, recall? Group. Yes. The Democrats have a... They have Jews and Catholics and Protestants and uh, Mexicans and all kinds of so-called foreign people. Yeah. And the Mexicans are coming into the country. And, and part of that whole thing was the original uh, grand coalition of Franklin Roosevelt. He spoke to all classes. In other words, it, it was... Uh, he, he wanted to get the votes of everybody. Uh, yep. And he included in some of the f uh, groups that you just mentioned were the intellectuals. Um, in other words, uh, college communities tend to vote Democratic. Uh, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan.
Well, the college community, you don't have to persuade them to vote. They usually know what they're voting for. So you don't, you don't, Franklin Roosevelt didn't say, hey, intellectuals, come no. out there and vote. But he did create the brain trust. He had a brain trust. Now that's true. And the idea of expertise that's in right. policy that's right. became a dominant uh, mainstream concept right. of right. how to manage the government. Right. Management of the government is a whole different issue. That's called the New Deal. Bureaucracy. And alphabetical agencies. Competence, in my opinion, is one of the most underrated qualities in a president. Competent, I say age, but you tell us about competence. Well, competence is, uh, is understanding the mood of the country. It's understanding what policies are going to work and well, what aren't. Propaganda. Well, it's not propaganda. It's management. It's, uh, it's effectiveness. In other words, Bill Clinton was a competent president. Now he did a. He was not a great president. He was competent. Yes. He knew how to work but the Congress. But eighty percent of the presidents are competent. No. <laughs> well, we'll debate that at some. Many time. of them are incompetent. Who was the most incompetent president? Well, there, there, there were a, there were a lot in the nineteenth century. They, we will say inconsequential, routine presidents. But well, they didn't make any disastrous failings. Well, George Bush was, uh, W. Bush was incompetent. He, Why he, was he in, un, incompetent? Well, we had, he, he had the Iraq War, the Afghanistan No, he was an imperialist. He knew exactly what he was doing. Well, he, he, he uh, was also in charge of the banking crisis, the second major banking crisis now, minute, in 20 wait, years. Wait a minute. Let's talk about George W. Bush. W. Bush. Right. The, what the, is the second banking crisis? The financial crisis of 2007? Right, the banks are owned by private people. The banks speculate and the banks go cr crashing. And it's got, they don't, the presidents don't own the banks. They're in debt constantly. Well, they, they, they don't, quote, own the banks, but right. they, they are in charge of the regulation of the banks. Yes, that is true. <laughs> They're responsible for making sure That's that, right. that the books true. aren't being cooked. Okay. Yeah, but, the, but the books are being cooked. That's what I said. Okay. That's incompetence. No, that's incompetence. That's theft. Well, theft, <laughs> whatever. I that's mean, I, I don't think that Bush stole any money, if that's what you're accusing him of. I think that's nonsense. I think that he was incompetent. I'm just giving an example. That's an opinion. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's the issue of competence and incompetence. Uh, there well, was a debate that until the capital, well. There was a I financial disagree. financial crisis under Ronald Reagan. It was called the Savings and Loan. Uh, yes, that's same true. thing. Deregulation. They didn't keep their but eyes. Ronald Reagan got reelected anyway. Well, that's because they kept the banking crisis kind of quiet in 1984. Okay. But if you go back and you check the be the beginning of the crisis, these bank crises happen over many years. They don't okay. happen suddenly. All right. Uh, of course, the Great Depression was sort of an exception. That's when everybody realized that the money was not in the in the cupboard. Uh, that's when uh, when we see the famous movie "It's a Wonderful Life," that shows the the bank, the savings and loan of uh, the town in question, Jimmy Stewart, looking at the clock, waiting for that clock right. to to turn to five o'clock so that they can shut the safe. Yeah, that was the bank holiday. Yeah. Five days. And then he said, how much money do we have in the safe? And I know what happened in Baldwin. Yeah, and the brother said, two dollars. And he okay. threw his confetti in the air and said, we made it until Monday. Right. <laughs> and then on Monday, he explained uh, what a bank was, what a savings and loan did. Right, okay. So he, he said, well, we loan money out for mortgages. All right. And sometimes in America, this goes in ebbs and flows. Housing is a key commodity uh, that's very determinative. Of Everybody the, bought a house on mortgage. And a mortgage that's is... You buy a house. Is you don't own the house, the bank does. Yeah, but there are some millionaires who can afford to never have a mortgage. Pay cash. Yeah, pay for cash. Right. right. Okay. And Donald Trump isn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> He's bought everything on credit, and then he he reneges on his debts. Okay. Fine. So he's an All expert right. on one thing only. Right. Well, bankruptcy. 
and uh, I hope it doesn't happen to America during his presidency. But uh, don't be surprised if it doesn't, because one famous economist who uh, took a historical perspective on economics, John Kenneth Galbraith, once said that America he has a new dealer, by the way. Right, America has a banking crisis every 20 years. The problem is. Nobody can remember the last one. <laughs> that's memory of history. That's my slogan. Yep, and that's history is everything. That's why John Kenneth Galbraith wrote great books about economics in the fifties. He was a good economic historian. Fifties. He was. He was and sixties. Sixties, right? He knew how to popularize yes, he, the he pop ideas. He that's right. He took the complex. Abstruse spoke in ordinary language, and that was my job. Yeah, well, I spoke in ordinary language. That's what teachers do. Right. Yes. And I'm a, a better teacher than researcher. Well, that's probably true. Lyle McGue was my colleague. Uh huh. Was a better researcher. He was a Presbyterian. He was always a loyal Presbyterian, and he got his PhD, and he's an expert on. Uh, um, uh, Expert on uh, the last uh, the World War One? No, Lyle McGill came to Ohio University. Yeah, I I was a classmate with uh, his son. Yeah, okay. same name, Lyle McGill. Right. He was the smartest kid in our class. He was very smart. Him and Myel Lynn. And they were <laughs> interdirected people. They right. sat down. And they did their homework and were interdirected. Yeah. Now. Now, Brian Good was the valedictorian, All but... Right. Well, forget about Brian Good for a moment. <laughs> I would say that my wife, Lois, has three MAs. Okay. And I have one PhD. Right. And the difference is, according to uh, Riesman, David Riesman is, he wrote a book on the American character. Right, I think I've heard of it. The Lonely. The Lonely, okay. The Lonely Crowd. The Lonely Crowd. And it's about interdirected people. Well, it's about all three. Right. They were interdirected, other directed, and outer directed. Yeah. Okay. Now, outer directed is religion, philosophy, politics, values. Not politics, but values. Okay. Now, a politician is outer directed because he's looking for votes. Yeah. He's not a researcher. But uh, the brain trust of Franklin Roosevelt were researchers. They were experts. Experts. There you got it. Burley, Burley wrote it. For instance, Adolf Burley, A.A. Right. A. Burley, right. wrote a book about called The Modern Corporation. Very good. Now, I've that heard of him. is a famous book. Right. I haven't read it, but I've, I've But he it. did an analysis explaining what the modern corporation was, so good. he knew a lot about economics. He was a good economic historian. And he was a part of the liberal... Uh, New York Party. Uh, That's he, right. Well, New York, New York State well, had, they had, had a, a third, third party, party once in a while. Yes, called a liberal. They had yeah. communist parties. They had liberal parties, sure. socialist parties, but those parties fade and die. Fade and died because, okay. the, for instance, the Communist Party in the 1930s was was more than 50 percent from New York. Uh, okay, <laughs> I agree with that. It's not an idea that spread that far, okay. and thus the Red Scares of the 1950s right. were, were total exaggeration. And they were certainly an exaggeration, but there, not total. There, no, no, not total. Not total, but there was no infiltration of Hollywood and all well, the nonsense. Well, there was a little infiltration. No, there were, there were a few screenwriters that happened to be communists. Okay, well, that's But there wasn't hidden brainwashing in the movies. That's nonsense. What do you mean by brainwashing? That's a slogan. Well, that was J. Edgar Hoover's. Oh. No, I think that came from Mitt Romney. No. He said, I've been brainwashed. Well, he used the phrase brainwashed, yeah, in 68, well, and that's right. why he was doomed that's from that point on. That's the first time I heard it. But, uh, but uh, the idea of brainwashing has been around for a long time. Well, I would like to question that. You he, tell me that before that, whoever used that term. Well, it was used in the CIA in the 50s. It in was the 50s? Have you ever seen the Manchurian Candidate, the movie? Yes. I've okay. Seen That's brainwashing. Okay. They had LSD. Doesn't have anything to do with LSD. LSD, and it was not called brainwashing. It was, they thought that they, uh, they could get spies to confess. That's what it was. It was a so-called secret drug. 
Well, you're getting a little far afield here. Um, well, you're going from medicine to propaganda. No, I, I, okay, I just why? mentioned a movie from the 1950s. That's a movie. That's a fictional interpretation. It was made in 62, but it That's was a, a book. A book. By a guy that worked in the CIA. That's true. And that's what it, the theme was. Go ahead. I agree with that. It was a trained assassin yeah. based on brainwashing. But let's move on to a real subject here. Good. Romney, George Romney, yes. uh, when he ran for president, um, <clears throat> used that phrase and he was finished. Finished. Because the media picked up on it and... He said, you're using... His comment, by the way, was, I was brainwashed on Vietnam. Well, you have the exact quote. <laughs> You're more accurate on that. Yeah. That's very good. So anyway... You've got a complete sentence there. That's called a gaff. A gaff. Okay, fine. And gaffs are sometimes... You know a lot about propaganda. N gaffs are sometimes known as inadvertent truths. Okay. Anyway, Romney, George Romney, who had, had been the governor of Michigan... Who went, was an automobile dealer. Well, he went into the, into the Nixon administration... Yeah. He, he managed HUD. Yeah. Now, Romney, by the way, was a good example of, of a competent. He was a manager. All right. He knew, he knew how to, how to uh, get things done right. from the corporate management perspective. As he was competent. So competency was something that George Romney had. But his problem was communication. <laughs> Pro propaganda. Communication problems. Nixon knew how to stick to the script. Right. Nixon knew how to uh, say the right things at the right times on many issues that convinced the so-called silent majority that he was uh, he would be the better president. Okay. Now Go he ahead. won in '68 for a lot of reasons, but obviously uh, George Wallace's run hurt the Democratic Party and the unpopularity of the war. The Vietnam now, when War. When you say unpopularity of the Vietnam War, that's a wide. Some people support it and yeah, others hated it. But it was growing. The opposition was growing. The opposition was growing. And by the 68 election, because of the Tet Offensive, because of. Well, explain the Tet Offensive. That's a slogan that's long been forgotten. What it's is the Tet Offensive? It's not a slogan. It's an important event that All happened right. in 1968. What, We're on the what, 50th what, what, anniversary. All right. What is the Tet Offensive? The Tet, the Tet Offensive was a uh, counterattack by the North Vietnamese that corresponded with the Vietnamese holiday of Tet. Yeah, and they Tet almost, is a new year. They almost took. Uh, uh, Saigon. Right. And they, the, they the failed. Were up in Hanoi. They failed, but they convinced Walter Cronkite. Yes. He went to Vietnam to figure it out. And he saw it. He saw it firsthand. I don't know whether it was two weeks or three weeks. Came back on national television, That's said, right. I... We cannot win in Vietnam. That's we, right. We may have... He uh, told the truth. Right. We may have legitimate goals. We may have this. We may have that. But we're not going to win this war. That's true. These uh, Vietnamese are not going to surrender. Right. And they have more people. More, well, more they had people. 44 million people. How yeah. can a few white GIs control 44 million people? Impossible. Well, well not in that kind of territory. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was jungle. Yes, that's right. And uh, the United States was, uh, the military was so dumb, they'd have people training in Alaska. <laughs> they thought that bombers <laughs> could bomb the jungle. And they yeah. Agent Orange on it. Right. They used chemical Pollution. weapons. Yeah. And chemical that was a weapons. disaster, too. Well, it was a big disaster. Okay, fine because it got into the water and it created... And we have polluted soil all over the United States and people are dying of cancer. Well, there's that problem too. Th those Opioid are the, crisis. Well, that's a, <laughs> got nothing it's to a do with crisis. the water. Nothing to do with the water. Well, you've been to Michigan. The water is polluted. They have to re replace all of the pipes. They're dying of lead poisoning. Right, but that's the plumbing, not, right. not the water. The water is actually, believe it or not, better than it was back in the 60s. All right. Well, that's a little footnote. Well, the EPA was created okay, uh, in fine. 1970. All right. You've got the fine-tuning. Gaylord Nelson. You uh, know a lot about history. Wisconsin senator. Uh, came up with Earth Day. Right. And then they created the EPA. Fine. Um, that was actually a Nixon uh, right. compromise. Right. Uh, one thing that he does deserve credit on.
Absolutely. And the EPA, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, yes. is actually one of the most important federal agencies now because it protects America's air, its water, and its land. Okay. And air, water, and land, if you will recall Aristotle right. and the Greek idea of the universe, those were three of the four components. The other was now fire. Way off the subject. When way off the subject, that. but Aristotle is uh, is is a useful metaphor sometimes no, for understanding. No, he's a philosopher. Well, he's a philosopher, but he Plato and Aristotle was but the he, greatest two of the greatest philosophers in ancient Greece. He created a mythology of thinking about things, of well, connecting. Not mythology. No, methodology. Oh, method. Thank you. Thank methodology. You methodology. Yes. Okay, go ahead. That's semi-science. Um, no. Aristotle didn't create science, but he did create a concept of how to think well, about the world. logic. Yeah. Okay, logic. Poetics. He wrote, he wrote a number of books, many yes, okay. books. All right, fine. Anyway, uh, EPA, yeah. We currently have uh, a president who pretty much wants to abolish the EPA. He has a clown named Scott Pruitt. Yes, I've heard of him. Who's running for president. He's from Oklahoma, isn't he? He was the attorney general of Oklahoma, but he's decided that he's going to run for president in 2024. Do you think he'll win? So he's traveling around the country. Do on, you think him? he'll win? No. Okay. He's well, going to, he's got, he's. So he's a flash in the pan. He might not survive uh, two more months in the oh, Donald Trump's okay. cabinet. Because well, I hope you're right. There's a lot of scrutiny about what he's been doing. That's right. Now, luckily for the American system of government, many of these EPA uh, regulations that he's attempted to overturn have been suspended by the courts. In other words, the courts are part of the process of the American government. That's true. So as bad as things sometimes look, uh, always read the fine print. Good. In other words, uh, six or seven of these regulations have already been struck down. Good. Attempts to deregulate have not worked. Congress must change laws in right. some cases. And this is why... Um, I believe in the Constitution Trump and, and, and the law, the law of the land. ...has tried to do much more than he's actually accomplished. But intentions matter. We know where Scott Pruitt sits. He's now involved in a financial scandal right. because he's been renting a uh, kind of an Airbnb apartment... Uh, in Washington, D.C. for $50, $50 a night from a industry VP, lobbyist. Yep. And there's a quid pro quo there. He's there's making money. Some corruption. What's the, he going to do with his money? Well, I don't know if he's making money. I'm, he's saving money. Saving money and he's putting it in the bank. He, no, he's got a conflict of interest. Conflict of interest, all right. Fine. And his daughter... I don't know what he's doing with it. Well, his, his daughter stays there, but this is one okay, of the fine. investigative threads... That's one of the threads. ...that may doom Scott Pruitt. Hopefully. And he's uh, he's on the down, the down track. Good. Um, we are both hoping that the Democrats win big. Donald in Trump famously said, Donald Trump famously said a couple of weeks ago, I like his work product, <laughs> which, is, which is an amusing, uh, in my opinion, amusing uh, concept of... Well, it's kind of common sense. Yeah. It's, uh, That's one thing that, uh, Trump is good at, is talking to the common man. Right. I'm going to make America great again. Oh, we, we're all great. Okay. Well, he's not going to make he, America great again. He talks about football players and so forth and so on. So uh, why he's he's lo he's lost that battle. Wait, who, what battle has he lost? Donald president Donald Trump is president of the United States. He is, and he's only president because of quirks in the electoral college. Well, Hillary well, Clinton no, not won. Because. That's one little minor factor. It's a minor. Hillary. What do you mean by quirks? Okay, Hillary Clinton got three million more votes than Donald Trump. In California, in Texas, and so forth, in the big states. Not in Texas, but in all California. Right, all right, so we're talking about the 60 states. 77,000 voters in three states determine the outcome of the election. All right, that's true. That's, those are the facts. Well, those are the law. Well, that's what the law says. They're the, those are the facts. Those are the facts. 
and uh, you want to change the law. Well, I, I I think that it's absurd when a when a, a race is almost 50-50 that all of the electoral okay, votes go that's to the a winner. Okay, about the future. Let's talk about the past. What yep. has history decided? I'm not interested in speculation about the future. No. Okay, fine. I I am a little more interested more interested in the speculation. Okay, go because ahead. the speculation of, be of the future is uh, well, you're going to live longer than I. Do. Based on the experience of the past. That's true. And we we must learn from experience. I agree with that 100 percent. That uh, is a famous uh, uh, paraphrase of Oliver Wendell Holmes. Yeah. And experience, we have to learn. About people who sometimes guess right and sometimes guess wrong. Yeah, but we have to learn from our mistakes. Fine. And we, one we, of the we. well, okay, we, the American people. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's and, the task of. History. And we've been falling. That's the has Both philosophers and history are trying to educate the American people. That's we're, true. We're, we're we're falling short in the area of citizenship. In but the area true. of of informed. Democracy's in decline. In you would agree with that. Informed citizenship. Right. Democracy it, may not return again. It's in decline, uh, but Trump, I think, has perhaps woken some people up. Um, Hopefully he has. There's a, there's a resistance movement, as they say. Yes, the 2008 There's even a slogan we'll prove it. called resist. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In 2008, when the votes are counted, they're going to say the Democrats have picked up seats in the Senate and in the House. 2018. 2018. I'm looking forward to the results. Well, we can have another show on that sometime. Well, if you yeah. come back, <laughs> and, and of course, Paul Ryan just uh, yesterday that's good news. decided he's not running for that's re-election. That's good news. That shows you the divisions in the Republican Party. Shows the, the divisions. The Trumpsters and the people who just want to take the money and go home and go to the beach. Well, I don't know what that means, but what are they going to do with their money? <laughs> well, <laughs> the Republican Party is is interested in far more. Uh, than party is money. Social engineering is what I call it. The Republican Party. They want to bring back school prayer. They want to. Uh, okay, that's a slogan. They they want to restrict abortion. They have a. Yes, yes, we know the abortion problem. You know, they want to make you salute the flag. Yes, yes, that's that unconstitutional. Kind of yeah. So. No one is required to salute the flag under the present interpretation. They of have a social agenda that is uh, beyond money. It's. No doubt about that. And the, that's where they're losing, by the way. The, the uh, vast majority of the American people have rejected uh, these ideas. Which these ideas are so sweeping again. They haven't. You they have haven't, to take the ideas one by one. Well, they haven't prevailed. Okay. They've, they've, they've nicked a few things at the corners. In other words, the abortion issue is a good example. The, uh, are the Republicans or the Democrats winning on votes for the abortion? Um, depends what state. Ah, now we're getting to it. Yes. <laughs> That's good. That's the Electoral College. That's the federal system. In, in North Dakota, the Republicans win on abortion. Okay, fine. In New York State, the Democrats do. Okay, so it, fine. it's based on geography and, and the two party system. Background and population and the, right. and the issues involving uh, what it was like in United the United States is a federal government. Good old days. The good old days were it not is very a good. Government. We, we have the church and state separate. Yes. But and it is the job of the politician to inform the voters. That is the true, that is a good politician. Uh huh. Now, an educator is a professional educator and becomes a specialist in chemistry or so on and so forth. Okay. But you can also do a history of chemistry. You can do a history of biology, you can do a history of sports. Everything can be written from the point of view of history. So that is why history is everything. Well, I don't know that it's everything, but well, we'll, have that de we'll have that debate some okay. other time. Let's get back to uh, Schlesinger. There's two ways of looking at the world, through Let, the philosophy Let's get back to Schlesinger. Go ahead, Schlesinger. What do, what do you want to say about Arthur Schlesinger? Arthur Schlesinger. Uh, you... you decided that this would be our topic. Yeah, okay. Okay. I would say that Arthur Schlesinger tried to rate all of the presidents of the United States. Okay. And he said the top presidents were Washington, Lincoln, uh, and, and, and Roosevelt, and so forth and so on. That was his 
analysis. Right. Okay. Now, I limited my investigation. I said in my memoirs, I am going to rate the presidents in my lifetime. That's fine. They begin with Franklin, Rosa, they go through Truman, and they go through 45 presidents. And the drift has been to the right and more conservatism. And the Republican Party are dominant, very dominant, from the Goldwater election. And the Democratic Party is not united. There are too right. many issues in the Democrat, too many debates in the Democratic Party in order to win. And he's not going to, Trump is not going to be impeached. Who's going to impeach him? Well, he might be impeached if the Democrats take control of the if, House, but that's speculation. Speculation. Good. Now we got it. Okay. So we don't want to go down that route, and he's certainly not going to be removed because it requires a two-thirds uh, vote in the Senate. Right. And that's not going to that's happen. constitutional law. In fact, the Democrats will be lucky if they even win the Senate because there just aren't enough seats up for okay. grabs. Fine that they can grab, as they say. Yeah, we're, we're, we're There's hopeful. There's only about hopeful. two or three. I'm and looking forward to the counting of the results. Well, let's, we'll know that in the second, uh, the first Tuesday of November. Okay, <laughs> come back again. And the first Tuesday of November, unless, well, never mind. It, 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 it can't be the first, apparently, for some reason. Uh, but this, this is an ancient uh, American tradition about the harvest that I do think needs to go as well. I wish it would. Uh, I wish they would change the election day. I wish they would have it on a, on a, on a, sun, a weekend day, a Sunday or whatever, and more people would vote. And that is really the, uh, the, the problem. In presidential elections, uh, 52%, 53% turn out to vote. In non-presidential elections, the way, off year, way down, 38%. That's what. That's so true fact. That's why there's a difference uh, in, the, in the results. But the Republicans win in all elections. Well, they don't win in all, but they they are across the board. They've been winning will, lately. Well, ever since Goldwater. You well, will not criticize a Jimmy Carter won. Now, wait, yes, he was a minority. He slipped in. Bill Clinton won, and so did Barack Obama. So it's not... Yeah, they, the Democrats are still alive. Yes. Well, hopefully, they're still alive. Well, We're all Democrats. Well, they're still alive, but... Uh, We're not yet a one-party dictatorship. Not yet. Politics, as American history shows, goes in ebbs and flows. That's true. And the, the Republican Party was dominant right. from 1860... Uh, until 1932. More or less, then that's the true. the Great Depression hit, and the people said, wait a minute, these guys don't know what they're doing. Right. Put in Franklin Roosevelt. But then after Franklin Roosevelt, the Democrats themselves became more conservative. Well, they became more conservative. On the issue of communism. Because of the 1950s and whatnot. But I think if you analyze presidential history, you would say that Eisenhower, who was the only Republican who served between Franklin Roosevelt and uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, was, was a liberal Republican. Accommodated the New Deal. He accepted the New Deal. He didn't want to overturn it. He didn't. He worked for the army. He got socialized medicine. Well, yeah, and he, and he built the the, f the highway system. I was a major in the army uh, when I was in the army. He was a major, and he was reading the Nation magazine, and I was very suspicious of the Nation magazine at that time because my father was a, a Republican and they said, oh, the Nation, that was, that's a communist paper. I said, hey, I see you read the Nation. I said, you're a major in the Army. I said, Is, isn't that uh, kind of peculiar? Aren't you an oddball? And he said, no. He says, I retire with a pension. I believe in socialized medicine for me. <laughs> right. He told me, Frank out. Right, right, right out. Well, and... and, and so the, if you serve in the Army and Navy, you get a lifetime insurance. The GI Bill. I was offered lifetime insurance. Franklin Roosevelt... And I turned it down because I was penny pinching. Okay. And I said, no, I'll, I said, I'll take the cash and go around and, and spend it. But that was one of the big mistakes of my life. Or were the minor mistakes in my life? Well, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into your 
personal situation, but I mean, the GI Bill was introduced in 1944, speaking of Franklin Roosevelt, yes, to deal with uh, returning uh, troops right. from World War II. Right. They were going to give out educational benefits. That's right. And some historians, uh, this is one theory. Without the GI Bill, I probably would not have been a historian today. Right. And the GI Bill did more to improve the United States than any other thing they well, did. It, it did a lot to improve. Because it allowed millions of men. That's and, right. And they were mainly men. Right. A few women, but right. mainly men to get subsidized education. That's so true. many men when they came back from World War II said, well, why don't I go to college? I right. couldn't afford it back in 1928. Right. You were in the baby boom. I was in the baby trough. That's the difference. Yeah. You, were you born had too many competitors. You were born during the Depression. Right. Right. And jobs were good for high school when I got out of there. And then they were good in, in getting into a college, yeah, and then they were good in getting a, an MA and a BA and a PhD. Now the it's very difficult to get a PhD today. Well, you can get them, but the, but it's difficult to land a position. Yeah, you with got, your PhD. You can't get a PhD that will allow you to go to Wall Street or go to the Supreme you, Court. You ha you have to get the PhD in the right subject. Yeah, That's you the key. Get it in in the Big Ten or the Ivy League. And the right subject. And a couple of schools in California. But in general, Ohio University is becoming a tech school. It's becoming a school that's majoring in sports. Well, I don't know what Ohio University, <laughs> I don't know enough about the local Ohio University situation sports to comment on Sports is their big it. association. We get sports people from Chicago. We have the best sports program in the United States, apparently, or at least from Chicago East. Well, there's a there's yeah there's a lot of sports management uh, majors. Okay, that's there's no doubt about that. So you can get a PhD in sports, and I call that a very very weak technical degree. Right. That's credentialism. But that's sort of an exception. All right. For, all right. So I'm not too most sure. most. What of is the, the topic now? I kind of got most off. of the sports management people cannot cache their degree, but some what can. Mean, what do you mean by cache? Cash in on their degree. They can't make money? They can make money, but they have to kind of go through the ranks. they got to start out at the bottom. And, well, and everybody has to start out yeah. if you don't have money. S well. So that's inherited. Let's drop this subject. Okay, I don't want to talk about Ohio University and your uh, theories of sports management. Sports is uh, it's entertainment. That's it, all it is. It's entertainment. And America. And is, Hollywood is an entertainment is industry. The entertainment Hollywood industrial is the complex. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 the way somebody described. Well, there's a military industrial complex. right, okay. the one that's important. Right. Okay. Good. And of course, nowadays we have the communications industrial complex that's taken over the whole thing. By the way, on the baby boomer thing, uh, just to mention, there's two groups of baby boomers. All right. The ones that were born right after the war. Um, were able to, uh, you know, take their degrees and advance rather quickly. Are you talking about yourself or your? No, I'm, I'm at the end of the baby boom generation, okay. and we were confronted with economic problems while we were in junior high school. Yes. While we were in high school. Yes. In other words, in the 70s, because of the Vietnam War, because of the oil embargo in 1973, right. the American economy changed radically right. for many reasons. Right. Uh, and NAFTA had nothing to do with it. It didn't well, it exist had something yet. To do with well, it. it didn't exist yet. NAFTA started under Reagan, but no, 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 no. Yes, it did. NAFTA it, studied before that. Well, GATT. It was called GATT. But let's not North get in. The, let's oh, not get into that. That's a different thing. GATT is general uh, agreement on, on tariffs. tariffs. NAFTA is the North American. Right, and that Mexico was developed in Canada. Developed right. later in the 1980s. All right. So why are we going around the barn? Well, I. I why not, don't we stick to the chronology? Well, I'm just explaining uh, uh, why right, the fine. 70s were were difficult. Okay, fine. I from, agree with that. From a uh, longitudinal perspective, as they say, longitudinal right. studies. Go uh, ahead. It's always an interesting fine. topic. All right. Um, but anyway, the tail end of the baby boom generation. Yeah, we had. Uh, economic problems from the get-go. All right, fine. It happened when we were in junior high, and 
I don't know that it ever really recovered until no, it didn't. Bill Clinton became president. Bill Clinton was a holdover. He was the first man to understand the budget problem well. Oh, not the first man, not maybe the first politician. From the beginning of the deficit spending, the chronic what deficit. Year, what years are we talking about? 69 is when it all began when, under Richard when, Nixon. What happened in 69? Richard Nixon became president. He all was right. inaugurated. All right. That's when the deficit spending began. Well, there was deficit spending before that. There was deficit spending ever since Franklin Roosevelt. For World War II, yes. Okay. But then they had very high taxes in the 1950s under Eisenhower to get the budget All back right, in now order. Two, now we're talking about two good presidents, Truman and Eisenhower. They said, pay as you go. When the Korean War opened up, Truman said, pay as you go. We're not going into the Korean War with debt. Right. Because he knew what the Depression was. Now, I believe in pay as you go. But very, very few presidents ever said that again. Well, no. Okay. That, that was one of the problems with the Vietnam War. Yes, that's okay. That's why they had a dollar crisis in that's the right. 60s. Now we have then they had to, money everywhere. They had to go the off. The gold standard became the gold exchange standard, and now we have a so-called computer money. Floating dollar. Yeah.